Welcome, everyone. Great to see you all again. And for those who are joining us for the first time, welcome um, from people all over Victoria. So I just want to let you know that the session is being recorded today. And for the benefit of all of us joining today and knowing that we all have different levels of bandwidth, could I please ask you to mute your microphone during the presentation and turn off your video? Later in the webinar, we'll be asking for your contributions. And by all means, if you would like to turn on your video to ask a question and engage, um, that would be fine. For those who have not used this platform before, if you move your mouse down to the about two thirds, three quarters of the way down, you'll notice a bar at the bottom of the screen with a hand in it. If you push the hand, it means you'd like to ask a question. If you want to write a question, there is a little talking balloon. And if you push that, then a side screen will show up and you can type your question in the sidebar and we'll try to answer them. For those who see neither the hand or the chat box, which is some of you, please just feel free to send me an email. I've got my email open and your questions during that time will be put back into the session and I will, I will, I will report them during the session. So that's no problem at all. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and Tungarong Nation, as well as the Indigenous people of the lands you are joining in from. Well, without further ado, we do welcome back a warm welcome for Trudy because she's in her garage again um, for the second webinar in the series of Messaging for Change. And today's webinar will be on values. Thanks for joining us. Over to you, Trudy. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to everyone who participated in our first session last week and a very warm welcome to those of you joining the first time this week. Um, my name is Trudy Ryan. I'm from Words for Change in North East Victoria and I work with organisations and people making positive change across the environmental and social sectors. And it's a great pleasure to work with so many of you land care facilitators and coordinators again today. Right, so where are we? Last week, in the first of our four webinar series, we looked at facts and frames as a foundation for understanding how people come to reason and what this means for our communications. Today is all about values, and in our third and fourth sessions, we'll look at language choices and how we can bring all this knowledge together to create really powerful and empowering values-based messages. Um, so today, we're going to look at human values motivation and how our values are formed and how they shape our attitudes and behaviours. We'll look in detail at the range of human values that we all recognise and are capable of holding and being motivated by, and then we'll dig a bit deeper into values, into the what lies beneath type stuff. The, the values that we're motivated by, the deeper drivers and the determinants of values, and the different mindsets that these can prime us into. We'll talk about this relevant to land care and environmental communications more generally, where we want to activate the values that are associated with greater good and pro-environmental, pro-community orientated values and behaviours. So what are our values? Well, our values pretty much define us. When we think about our values, we think about what's important to us in life. And there are some recognisable characteristics of values. So values transcend situations. So if honesty is important to you in your personal life, it will also be important to you in your work life as well. Values are tied to a effect and this means that we feel very deeply about our values so if you value equality the value of equality and you are denied that access to that value to experience that value you'll be very agitated and upset but if equality is important to you and you get to experience it you'll be content you'll be satisfied our values relate to desirable goals so they motivate action so, for example, if you're motivated by social power and recognition, you'll work very hard to compete with people to realise these goals for yourself. Values you shape our personal priorities. We're all different. We're all capable of being motivated, motivated by a whole range of values. 
but we prioritise our values relative to each other. And in this way, values guide our behaviours and actions. We can trade off competing values in context. So if you're the type of person that values adventure over a sense of duty, your values might guide you to go on an extreme snowboarding trip rather than go to your great aunt's birthday party. So finally, values serve as standards. They provide a sense of right and wrong and what's our idea of what's worth doing or avoiding. We mostly only consciously question or contemplate our values when they feel conflicted, when we get that sense of internal dissonance and discomfort. So it's amazing that something so important to us, so fundamental and to our nature and so central to our being, mostly works beneath the level of our conscious awareness to guide our actions and behaviours. So we're not born with our values. Our values are shaped by our lived experience. All sorts of things work together to shape our personal values, our childhood, family of origin, the education that we received, the clubs, groups we belong to, um, our perception of social institutions, the media that we consume, our attitudes to money, how we think about the plight of others, how we interact with nature, the type and level of our civic engagement, our political leanings, all these things and more shape our values and then they go on to shape our values and attitudes, things like who do we vote for, what do we spend our money on, what do we spend our time doing, do we volunteer, all those things that, that go to make up your life. So our values are reinforced by positive feedback loops. This is like the frame activation that we talked about in week one, the neurons that fire together, wire together. So when we activate a value, that circuitry, that frame through which we see the world is strengthened and through repetition becomes stronger. So if you've ever wondered why the same people in your town seem to volunteer ac across every different organisation and club, this is why those positive feedback loops, loops reinforce our idea of normal behaviour. So we're constantly, if not consciously, but constantly calibrating our personal values against what we think are the values held by other people and the values displayed by institutions like governments, um, the courts, media, schools, church, you know, that sort of, sort of thing. So these perceptions all inform and feed each other. It's a complex iterative, iterative interaction. When one leads in one direction or another, it causes us to recalibrate our perception of the others. And this is the process by which our idea of social norms in values are formed. It's a constant sort of calibration. So let's get into the science of human values motivation. This is a human values map I emailed through last week. Hopefully you've all got a copy. Um, we can go through it on screen so we can and send it out later if not. Um, this is a human values map. It's based on the work of a man called Professor Shalem Swartz. He's a pioneer, of, absolute pioneer of values research. And this is known as the Swartz Value System or Framework. It's based on values surveys conducted in over 80 countries, 43 different languages over the past three or four decades. So it's, it's very reliable. Um, it shows universally understood values. So these are the values that all people can recognise in themselves and in others. It's important to note too that we're not making value judgments about values. Values are neither good or bad in themselves, they, they just are. And we're capable of holding or being motivated by this whole range of values, depending on context and on priming or activation as we'll go into. Um, the values that we tend to hold most of the time are what we call our values disposition describes the values that, that we mostly hold because, as I said earlier, our values mostly transcend or hold across situations. But So we tend to, we can be activated and motivated by all these values, but we tend to have a set of values that more or less guide us through our lives that are important to us. Um, before we move on to, I want to note that there's there's lots of other values schemes and lists of values and things like that if you have a look around on the literature and even if you Google it. Um, but this one is probably the most cited and the most actively used by social scientists. Um, don't get too caught up on the exact words. It's not 
intended to be an exhaustive list of all, all possible human values. Um, the other thing to point out is, the, is that the map shows the statistical relationship between values. So it's based on evidence, not intuitive judgment, even though it does feel right when you look at it. It's an evidence-based map based on all those studies across all those countries and languages. The values nearest to each other, the closer a value is, the more similar it is, and the more distant the values are, the more motivationally they distinct they are from each other. <clears throat> and we'll go into that in a bit more depth in a moment. So there's some lines between the categories to make it easy to talk about groups of values, but they're fairly arbitrary because people are complex and they don't conform to straight lines. So the values form in, fall into those 10 broad categories. So starting at 12 o'clock, these are universalism, benevolence, conformity, tradition, security, power, achievement, hedonism, stimulation and self-direction. So these are the values that we, we live by. So let's look at some of the properties of values. And understanding these properties of values will really help you in your communication work as land care facilitators and coordinators. So as I said, we're capable of being motivated by a whole range of values, but importantly, not at the same time. And this is because of the inhibition effect and you remember our friend from the Facts and Frame session. You can see his side profile. You can see his front profile. But you can't see them both at the exact same time. So one set of neural circuits fires up in our brain to see the side profile. And then that shuts down while another fires up to see the front profile. <clears throat> this, is, this mutual inhibition effect applies for values as well. So most profoundly for values that are distant or opposed to each other. So, for example, we can be motivated by choosing our own goals or obedience, but not at the same time. And as the parent of two teenagers, I can attest to that. We can be motivated by the idea of equality and also our personal social power, but not at the same time. <clears throat> Similarly, with daring and moderation, <clears throat> excuse me, they're values that we can hold but not at the same time because they're not compatible motivations. <clears throat> There's also a recognisable ripple effect or like a spillover effect with values as well. So if I draw attention to a particular value, other nearby similar or compatible values are also activated. So we'll go through an example to illustrate this point. Last week, <clears throat> Last week, I, I asked you to write down some things in the chat box that come, came to mind with the different frames, environmental protections versus environmental regulations. <clears throat> so they're different, two different words that mean very similar things, but that activate quite different reasoning frames, different values-based frames. So the, the people from the East were asked to, to provide some words around protection, some reactions, some you know, what associations, what emotions, what came to mind. He said things like feel positive, saving the environment, families, national parks, doing the right thing, warm and fuzzy, so feeling as well as, as analytical, and care with love. And so these values really firmly fall into this universal and use of universalism and benevolence value segments. Whereas the people in the West were asked to contemplate the word regulations, <clears throat> and they came up with words like associations like law, being made to care as opposed to being care with love above, red tape policy, rules, restrictions, fines. So very much a compliance frame, which falls into this power and security value segment or orientation. So you can pick up that ripple effect. Um, <laughs> A regulation frame might be appropriate in context depending on what your objective was. But if, for example, you wanted to sort of convince people to fence their creek lines to protect riparian veg from cattle grazing, you'd probably go with a protections frame rather than a, com a regulation frame because you want to activate those greater good, larger than self, good community feelings and values activations rather than that just compliance mindset. So they're very different motivations embedded within those words. 
The other really important thing to note is that values are like muscles. So the more you activate them, the stronger they get. Those neurons that wire together, fire together, and the more often they do that, the stronger they get. So that we do this, this, we build up our values muscles in messaging by drawing reference to certain values. And the ones that we can rely on to activate these pro-community, pro-environmental behaviours and actions. So remember, we're capable of seeing the world through different viewpoints and being motivated by all these different values. What we want to do in the environmental sector, what we want to do for land care, is try to activate the environmental stewardship and um, care, concern, justice, those sorts of values that will promote this sort of attitudes and behaviours. And importantly too, we want to subdue or suppress the type of values that hinder this type of thinking as well. So, if I was trying to sell you a luxury car or an expensive handbag or some skin cream or something, I'd very much be trying to activate what we call in extrinsic values. So these are the values around achievement and power. And you'll know these from advertising because they sort of get at your sense of how you are seen by others. So extrinsic refers to sort of outside of yourself. It's about motivated, being motivated by how you're seen by others. So for us working in land care, working in the broader field of environmental and social change, you know, trying to build care, connection, compassion, a sense of justice, unity, equality, we want to be engaging what we call the intrinsic values. So these are the, the bigger than self, greater good values. These are the values that are just inherently rewarding to pursue. It's not about how we're seen by others. So um, or one other important bit is that there's a really massive body of, body of work, like there are thousands of studies that look at how drawing attention to these intrinsic or extrinsic values in our messaging can have an impact on people's behaviours and attitudes. So even temporarily attracting people's attention towards some of the, the words that evoke these values so the words that we use in our newsletters or our social media posts or on posters or signs or, or whatever, even temporarily drawing attention to these values actually activates people into a mindset that's more consistent with behaviours and attitudes around those values. So we know through the, that um, muscle building approach, the neurons that fire together, wire together, once we get people's attention, we toggle them in, we toggle and hold them into this value framework that's going to help us in our work. We know if we keep building those muscles, they become stronger through activation and that becomes the way you see the world. So I'll provide some references to papers and studies where you can sort of look into this for yourself. Um, but just quickly today, I thought I'll illustrate how these intrinsic and extrinsic value primes have an impact on behaviour and attitudes, even by drawing attention in, in the most subtle ways. So here's a study where, and in social science, the, the experiment is actually often when people aren't expecting it. So it's based, based on observations that might be as they come into the experiment or leave, the actual behaviour is observed. In this case, there was two groups of um, people came in one group of people were asked to write, write down some words, what they thought about the importance of honesty. The second group was asked to just write down some words around ambition. So you know, people might be writing success and influence, that kind of thing. And then the researcher accidentally, on purpose, knocked over a tin of pencils and observed which of these people actually picked up the most pencils. Who do you think it was? It was the people that were primed with honesty values. Another study which looked at the impact of volunteering. So in this study there was three groups. Um, one, was, one group was asked to sort just word cards around benevolence, so care, compassion, love, honesty. The, another group was asked to sort words around achievement and another group had a neutral prime just who knows about furniture, the tables, chairs, that kind of thing. And then this was the experiment part. As people were leaving the room, 
the researcher said, can people hang around and help me set up for the next session? And as you might expect, more people that were primed with benevolence values, that it's sort of the benevolence cards, they were more likely to stay and help. But the really interesting thing and the thing that researchers weren't expecting was that the people that had been primed with the achievement values, those achievement words, actually set up the chairs a little bit further apart relative to each other than the people that had been primed with benevolence or just neutral primes. So these things, these impacts are happening to us beneath the level of our conscious awareness, but they're very powerful. In another study to look at the impact on of priming on recycling, there was a study people were put into four groups and they were given different true false quizzes, paper quiz forms to fill out about reasons to car share. So on the way out of the room, and this is the sort of experimental part, they were just asked to dispose of their paper quiz forms and they weren't told to use a particular bin, but the groups primed with environmental reasons to car share, put their papers in the recycle bin mostly, and the group primed by economic values, so money-saving reasons to car share, just mostly chucked theirs in the general waste bin. So there was a bit of a, a mix of both in the neutral prime and interestingly, the fourth group in which people sort of received a mix of those economic and environmental primes, so a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic extrinsic primes, found no sort of different patterns compared to that of the neutral group. So, so keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on about what happens when you try and mix your primes to sort of cover all bases. That actually really isn't that effective. All right, so just as a little change of pace here, We'll try a bit of interaction, if um, technology willing. What we might do now is, you've had a good look at this values map. I'd love for you, if you'd be willing, just to put um, a value of importance to you personally in the chat box. And as you do that, Kirsty, if you could please read them out. And I will attempt here in Beechworth on the screen to circle those values so that we can see them coming up in real time on the map. So remember, it's just a gut reaction. You don't have to think, overthink it. Just a value or two, if you like, that stands out for you personally, which you think you're motivated by. And just so that everyone's aware, you can use the email as well, my email, if the chat box doesn't work. So we've got kindness. Yeah, okay. So kindness, you can use one that's on the screen to be... Uh, mean, um, meaning great. in life. Yeah, okay. You're happy with that? Yep. All right. Um, kindness. Kindness. Kindness isn't actually, you know, like as I said before, they're not the. It's not that exhaustive list of values. Um, but I guess kindness could be helpful, depending on what the person's. <laughs> no, it's helpful. Yeah, no, that's all right. That's good. <laughs> and we've got creativity. <laughs> creativity. So there's just values that motivate you, values that are important to you. Protecting the environment. Yep. Expect that from the land carers. <laughs> Intelligence. Intelligence. Healthy. Yep. Social justice. Mm -hmm. Enjoying life. Nature. Yep. Unity with nature. Mm -hmm. I got that one. Okay. Honesty from the um, from my email. Yep. Okay. That's great. That gives the quality. Another one come up there, and again, the quality. Yeah, that's really good. That gives us a shows that we're all very different, but there is a bit of a ripple effect as well. Now, just to change, mix things up, and I'm going to attempt to change Please. people here. Um, a value that you think, if you just walked down to the the street today and bumped into your average Australian out there. What values do you think they would be motivated by? What sort of one or two values do you think the average person out there 
would be their guiding value of importance. So again, if you could type them in. Wealth, freedom, pleasure. <laughs> yeah, pleasure. Family mm -hmm. security. Yeah. Successful, sense of belonging times two, <laughs> social order. Mm -hmm. Sense of belonging again. Yep. Excuse my dodgy drawing with my finger <laughs> mouse here. Doing well. Very elegant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that gives us a fairly interesting picture of something that is um, quite a universal thing. And so, what we've mapped here. Varied life. Very, very varied life. life. Yeah. Yeah. So what we've kind of mapped here is a really common thing we find in these workshops, but it, it speaks to a broader human perception is that we actually, um, it's, called, it's called the perception gap. And so we say that we personally hold a set of values to be important to us, but we think other people don't have those same values. And generally, people around the world, and I'm just going to flick out to a map to demonstrate this. Thank you for those. Is that around the world, people, this, and this is based on, you know, oodles of studies, people say generally across the globe that the values of benevolence, universalism and self-direction are the most important to them personally. And these are the kind of values that, as if we averaged it on the group that we've had this morning, we would say that these are the values that are most important to us. But people think that other people hold power, stimulation and tradition values. Oh, sorry. People say that they personally, um, these values are of least importance to them. But there's a perception that people actually hold that other people hold power to be the most important. And, and this holds sort of broadly for Australians as well. So the global trends, so people say for themselves personally, it's those intrinsic values, it's benevolence, it's universalism, it's self-direction, it's care, compassion, community, looking after people, making sure everyone has a fair go, where people think that other people prioritise power. So this is, it's called the perception gap and it's played out here this morning on our very small scale as well. And it's a really, really important one to keep in mind. Um, I'll just go back to the last slide. It's an important one to keep in mind because we tend to massively underestimate people's capacity to care. You know, if we think that people actually just care about achievement and power, we think they don't care about our environmental issues and our campaigns and what we're trying to do. And if you think that, it curtails your thinking and it kind of puts you on the back foot. You know, it's hard to be creative if you start out thinking people don't care about this. It actually makes you sort of constrain your, your thoughts and you get into a bit of a defensive mode. And remember last week we talked about negating frames and how, how unproductive that is. So... We need to start, and this is very important for communications, and I try and do this with all my communications and messaging now, is start in the knowledge that people care. So there's just evidence um, from studies that are conducted every year all around the world from the World, world Values Study, and we have Australian Values Studies as well, is that universalism, benevolence and self-direction are the values that people actually personally prioritise the highest. So we start our communications in this knowledge, you know, feeling that people are actually on our side and want the things that we want. They want this environmental protection and care and stewardship. So we just need to activate those helpful community orientated environmental greater good intrinsic values that exist in everybody and know, just know in your mind that these are the values that most people personally prioritise. So it's a perception gap. Keep that in mind. All right. We're on the home stretch now. 
We'll, have, we'll leave that map behind us now. And what we're going to do is crunch all these human values, these 57 human values, down into 10 segments. Just so it's a little bit easier to talk about the deeper emotional motivations that sit behind these values. So I've also sent this image on PDF to you as well. So you don't need to try and draw it on the run. So you see those 10 groups still remain and their relative position to each other is the same. We've just reduced the complexity of the map. So we can further characterise or, or categorise these values into four broader higher order motivation categories. And these really sort of get to the tension behind the opposing values. So we've got over here our intrinsic values, the universalism and benevolence values, about self-transcendence, so going beyond the self, greater good, bigger than self values. And they oppose these self-enhancement, which is more about enhancing your self values around achievement and power. So some people shorthand these two compassionate values, a little bit easier to say compassion than self-transcendence, and shorthand self-enhancement down to selfish values. So, and also opposing, the other opposing values that we haven't talked much about today are the values around openness to change, stimulation, self-direction, and they oppose the conservation. So not conservation in the sense that we know it in environmental terms, but about conserving the status quo, keeping things the same, those security, tradition, conformity values. Hedonism falls a little bit into both the self openness to change and self-enhancement categories. So we can go a little bit deeper and we can keep dividing this pie up. And this one is about whether the values have a social or a personal focus, a motivational focus. So our values can, these values around universalism, benevolence, conformity, tradition, security are about the, about the welfare of groups. So think about the behaviours that people have displayed around keeping each other safe from coronavirus. They've been achieved through messages that really activate the we, the us, the together frames. On the left, for example, the values that fall into the power achievement, hedonism, stimulation and self-direction segments are more about a personal focus. So they're the ones that we tend to pursue with personal goals in mind. So we can sort of shorthand this to me or we. Are the values I'm activating in my communications, are they, are they activating a me or are they activating a, a we? So just a simple little check to ask yourself. All right, last stop on the values map. And this one's really extremely important because it relates to anxiety and fear and hope and either the promotion of gain, self-expansion, and growth as we have in these values around the top and these openness to change and self-transcendence compassionate values or by contrast and we're down the anxiety based territory down the bottom when we're talking about achievement power security conformity these values are about prevention of loss protection against threats and it's mostly because of the nature of these values up the top here, the intrinsic values, they're, they're limitless, they're unlimited, they're, they're infinite. You can't have enough universalism or kindness or compassion or benevolence. They're not limited. So we're not in competition for these resources, for these values. So we can be open-minded. We're, we're focused on gain and growth. There's no competition because there's, you can't compete over compassion. Down the bottom, however, these resources, they are more finite. So there's only, look how, look how desperately power is contested in the world. People will do any, some people do anything to hang on to power. Achievement is such a strong motivational focus for a lot of people. Security, these things are about protecting us in, mostly in groups, but also as, as individuals, sort of biological individuals protecting us against threat and preventing loss. So there's a lot in this diagram and I really encourage you to sort of, when you have a moment, give it a bit of quiet contemplation because it really does speak to so much of what drives us as humans. These values are really deep within us. 
they're really deeply entrenched in our evolutionary psychology and they really speak to our personal needs and also our needs as groups. So, and it shows when you think deeply about this map and what it's, what it's indicating, it really clearly demonstrates why these intrinsic values that I've marked in red are the most effective values to prime when we want to foreground in people's minds environmental care and greater good community orientated mindsets or frames. So when we're writing messages to activate these positive environmental behaviours, we want to be up in this intrinsic sector where there's hope, there's optimism, there's community spirit, where there's possibility. And also there's no competition as we have down the bottom. So even contrast for a moment how you feel physically, physiologically, emotionally, when you contemplate the gain, expansion, growth values up at the top, it makes you quite open-minded. And you compare that when you, when you think about how you feel when you consider those values down the bottom that are about prevention of loss, you know, don't take something off me. It actually gets you into a very different mind, mindset because fundamentally they essentially boil, boil down to a comparison of hope or fear. So it's very important to keep in mind for our messaging. What, mess, what values do we want to activate? What values-based frames do we want to foreground in people's minds? All right, so we'll play a little bit of Spoto now from around Victoria, as we all are located. Um, so now that we've got this knowledge about values and values activation or priming, it's important to think it's a, to, just as an educational exercise, what values are we activating in our land care messages? So for the learning purposes, I've pulled some real life examples of values based frames that are used by land care. So from across Australia that I've found on the web. So this is not to be critical. It's just an educational exercise. Um, you know, it's not for me to say what values land care should be activating. That's up to you. But what I'm doing here is drawing attention to the values that are being primed in your different messages. And it's a valuable exercise to go through and just consider, are these the values that you really want to activate in your messaging? So here's one from up on the New South Wales coast. Learn new skills with land care. You know, I love that. That's great. It's a great self-direction prime. It's an intrinsic value. It's about curiosity, purpose, creativity. It's great. Where do I join? Love it. Here's another really great one. This is a lovely message, a really powerful intrinsic prime. So land care brings people together. Who wouldn't want to join? Um, it's shared purpose. It's very powerful. It's empowering. It's bigger than self. It has a clear social or we focus. So we're in that motivational area. And it's about connection and growth and gain and coming together to do something good. So as a message, it, it really feels good. So this one I'm not so sure about. Um, there's a mix of values primed in this message, which can be problematic if the values that you're priming oppose each other. It's okay if you're up in the same area and you've got that ripple effect. But once you're getting that inhibition effect going, your messages just don't resonate with people because what it does is create this sort of dissonance in your brain and you're not kind of sure which way you go. So there's no see, think about, you know, is there a clear value signpost in your head saying think of it in these terms or think of it in these terms? When you've got different values being activated, you're not really sure what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to feel. So to deal with that, most people just switch off. So as we said, um, Last week, in, um, when we were working in these social and environmental fields and we having a lot of money to splash around or sink into our communication, we've got to be really strategic and we've got to take every opportunity for connection. We've got to get the most out of it. So mixed value messages don't really achieve that. So we've got self-direction, take action today. You know, that's clearly self-direction, do something prime. Heroes activates a, an achievement frame. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, restore the local environment that speaks to protecting the environment. That's about universalism. And then there's donate now, which is about money, which often falls into the power achievement type zone. So it's a real mix. 
um, remember, you want to give people that clear signpost, which way do you want them to reason, which way do you want them to go? So I just wanted to comment to you about the heroes tag. So heroes about achievement, possibly a little bit of power. We hear, we hear this term used a lot and it's used to celebrate and recognise the actions of our volunteers. But it's really worth asking the question of Landcare volunteers. Do they feel comfortable with this title? Does it motivate them? Does it reflect the values of why they became involved with Landcare? Um, what about people who do a lot but aren't recognised as heroes? What values does that activate? And can we just protect the environment because it's the right thing to do? Do we need to be rewarded? Um, so, of course, it's always important to acknowledge the efforts and dedication of volunteers, but perhaps, you know, there are other terms that could be used to activate those self-transcendence, those bigger-than-self values, so connectors, contributors, or just land carers. So, again, I don't say this to be critical, it's just to stimulate a little bit of thinking about what values are being activated in messages. Okay, now this is an interesting one, advertising a Land Care Australia raffle. It says, life is for living, not waiting. Win a trip to the Sunshine Coast, refer a friend and win. So we're really firmly in the achievement hedonism sector here, um, rocking the self-enhancement values. So again, it's not for me to say whether this is a good or bad message, but just consider for a moment, what does this value activation, what does it say about Land Care? So as a ticket buyer, do I care about, does it make me care about land care? No, I just want to win the trip to Noosa and, you know, a minute later and you can't even remember who the raffle's for. So, of course, as a not-for-profit, I know funding is just a part of life. I, I get it, you've got to do it. But we want to do more with our messages than just raise funds. So remember, everything you do communicates. Everything you do communicates. We want to do more than just raise funds. We want to raise interest. We want to raise support. We want to raise understanding, raise empathy, raise participation. So remember, we can't afford to do comms for comms sake. Make all these opportunities for connection count. Think about that perception gap. Trust that people will want to make a contribution because they value what they do. They support this environmental action as much as you do. It's okay to ask people to buy a raffle ticket to support your wildlife habitat on farms project. It will be more meaningful and memorable and people may even want to get involved. But think about the values priming. Just the last example, and this one's a really lovely values-based message, working together to care for our country. It feels good like it literally feels good, tap into how does it make you feel emotionally, physically, physiologically. It's supported by an active image of people doing just what the words say. So there's that really good message image coherence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. So it's really firmly in that intrinsic centre sector and you're getting like three intrinsic value segments for the price of one in this message. So that's, that's very good. It feels good. It draws you in and it makes you want to learn more and be part of it. So that's a really effective values-based message. All right, so just to finish off this part, if you're not sure what values to activate in your messages, just keep in mind that those intrinsic values around benevolence, universalism and self-direction, they're your friends. They're the values that we want to activate. So you can keep that little map handy and just think about when you're writing your messages, am I activating these values? Because they're the values that will get people to on board and interested in, and supportive of what you're doing. Remember, we all hold these values inside of us. You're just foregrounding those values for people to, to then receive your messages in that mindset. So, Ask the people in your group, why are they a part of land care? What motivates them to participate? And then reflect that back to them. Now, they're your supporters. So in political terms, you might say they're your base and they'll be the most authentic spreaders of your message to, to their friends and other people in your community. And you can do some research on what motivates people to, to participate in land care. 
So this Landcare Australia, Landcare Wellbeing Survey, has I think it's just closed. So those responses will be really, really useful communication resource for you to really dive into that and go, why are people getting involved? What do they get out of it? How can I reflect this back to you? How can we build those muscles through that, that activation and strengthening? Um, and I think this survey will be just all about intrinsic values. So it'll be very interesting to look into. So remember, intrinsic values activate positive change. In moments in time like these, like the corona lockdown that we've all shared, they really confirm our interdependence with each other. And how we message is how we go forward. So community connection, empathy, responsibility, creativity, stewardship, fairness frames will create really different reasoning outcomes in our messages than individualism, scarcity and competition frames. So let's go with hope over fear in our messaging. Just to finish up today, if you're interested, curious, learning more about your values, and of course we all are because these are the things that guide us through life, you can hop online and do a quick survey. I've got the link here. Um, there are quite a few different versions of values surveys online. This one uses the Swartz values system that we've talked about today. It's hosted by the University of Western Australia, and they'll tell you what value categories are most important and least important to you and how that compares to other Australians. So I really encourage you to do that. Okay, that's it for today. We've got time for questions. Thank you for your participation. Over to you, Kirsty. Thanks, Trudy. That was um, great. And I certainly um, resonated with me some of the words that you were saying. I've just got a question coming up here on email. Um, what about when we are trying to reach the more traditional farmers who aren't involved in land care and who seem to be more focused on profit over environment, for example? Is it not the best thing to refer to production benefits of practice, for example? That's from Cassie. So, Thanks, Cassie. Cassie, that's a really good question. And, and again, it depends on what the purpose of your message is. If it is just about, you know, improving production and profitability for farms, you might go with those values. But if you're trying to get people to, you know, retain patches of remnant vegetation on their farm, um, you know, not graze, you know, that native pasture or whatever till they can see it or whatever you're wanting to do, encourage bird life on farms, if you're trying to get those pro-environmental conservation, pro-community values, you need to sort of prime all the intrinsic values and know that everyone has them inside of them. Maybe not Donald Trump, but everybody else has them inside of them and you need to activate that in your messaging. But it depends on context and purpose. So as I said earlier, the you know, the advertisers of luxury cars are going to, you know, they're going to prime those more achievement orientated values to get people into that mindset where they're more likely to hand over their money. So it, it depends on what your purpose is. But if you're trying to get that environmental stewardship value through, you talk about those values in your messaging. I guess I was thinking more about things like soil biology projects, getting them to participate in participate in soil projects, for example. Yeah, so curiosity is a really, really good intrinsic value to prime. Um, you know, you, I find in comms you can really substitute a lot of what we traditionally would sort of use as sort of status achievement primes. You can shift those into curiosity and innovation and ingenuity so that we're more about We've got our head up in the gain space, not down in the protection space. Yeah, so if you're talking about soil biota, you, you can make, like, that's really interesting stuff and you can just really start with that assumption that people do prioritise curiosity and care and then if you get them curious and interested, they'll be more interested in perhaps doing, you know, land protection works that really promote that value that improves soil health. So, yeah, getting in with creativity and curiosity is a really important thing. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks, Cassie. I had a question, Trudy, while we wait for others to respond around colour. So ah. um, 
I don't know whether that's something that you delve into, but so often um, you might have a sign about um, some benevolence, mm. but it's in red and it sort of mm. feels like there's this conflicting um, message, I suppose. Mm. Um, is, do you deal a lot with that? Does does different colours initiate different yeah. um, feelings or...? Yeah, I, I don't know too much about it myself, but it's something I'm starting to look at all those sort of cues because we do take in so many different sensorial cues when we're deciding about our level of trust or interest in a message. There has been some work done on it about that, relate, you know, about what sort of um, mindsets that colour activates in you. And it's it's worth everything that you can do, every little piece of the puzzle that can help your message connect with people, engage and activate the muscles that you want to activate is really important. So, yeah, red can be can be shouty sometimes, you know. So it's worth looking into, definitely. It's all part of the picture. Thanks. Does anybody else have a question or a comment? Uh, feel free to use email or the chat box or turn your video on and your audio and let us see you and speak to us. We've got one from LW from Bus Coast Landcare. Could you discuss the values you would use on for e.g. web pages or donating to projects or programs? Mm. Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Thanks, Lisa. Um, as I said earlier, you know, that fundraising, it, it is a fact of life um, <clears throat> when you're working in these sort of non-profit areas. But... You can, I think you need to engage people first with the shared values that are going to get them to stay with you. If you just go straight to, we need money, give us money, you might you might get some. That sort of, you know, they call it clicktivism and it can be really effective. It's used a lot in, you know, we need, we need your donation now or this thing will close or this thing will happen. You know, people are generous, but you might get that short-term donation you might get, you know, you might get people to click on your website or whatever, but you want to hold them there. And the way you can hold them there is by priming those bigger than self, greater good values so that people get a little bit more switched in on, well, hang on a minute, this is important to me. This is tapping something deep inside of me. But if you're just asking for money, it's a little bit like we talked about last week. If we start all of our messages with problems, People think, well, I'm all good for problems, you know, thanks, but i got to pay my mortgage and my kids' school fees or whatever it else it is that you have to pay. If you're just sort of using Donate Now type primes, it does get you into that money space, into that extrinsic prime, and people then get into that resource protection mode, you know, don't take it off me. So you want to, you want to explain what that money will be used for rather than just going straight to the money. So so engage people first on the shared values of those intrinsic values and really be confident that they do have them inside of them. You're just sort of, you, you know, switching the light on basically, you're activating those values. Thanks, Trudy. I hope that was helpful. Um, I've got a question here from Rod. Um, actually, he's just put two up, but <laughs> can people hold somewhat conflicting values with them in order of priority, e.g. Yeah. a farmer, I'll plant some trees, but I'm going to drain that wetland to crop it, or is it just a means of justifying the action? Yep. Okay, there's a lot in that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for that. People will always hold and be capable of being motivated by a whole range of values. So think of that values map before. We've, we're capable of, of being motivated by every single one of those values. But we have a disposition, which means we tend to prioritise a suite of values more often than not. Sometimes those values, work, like we will prioritise them. And even if we don't, we don't sit there going, well, I put... I put wealth over power and I put intelligence over creativity. We don't sort of check off a list in our heads. It happens beneath the level of our conscious awareness and it only is when we have that kind of conflicting values, should I do this or should I do that because they're activating opposing values, 
that's when we have that dissonance and that conflict in our head and that's when we sort of might have a broader contemplation about what it is or it isn't we're intending to do. Um, in terms of your specific example about, you know, should I, should I do this or do that on my farm, which from an environmental conservation point of view might be in opposition, it might, you know, we do, we do, do trade-offs in our minds and with our actions. Um, and I guess in context, it depends on what the objective is that you're trying to do. So if you're talking to that farmer, you might sort of tease out those greater good environmental protection values and see if there isn't another solution or, or another action that can be taken to preserve that wetland in that case as well. So remember the ripple effect if you're talking about conserving a patch of bush for its, you know, its biological value, it's providing homes for wildlife, it's doing a whole range of things on that farm ecosystem. That mindset that will percolate out you know that will spread out those muscles will grow and you know in theory the farmer will start to see the rest of the farm through that mindset as well so the more we do it the more the stronger those activations become and the more that becomes our disposition but it does depend on context i hope that was um great rod Sorry, I was just about, there's a rod and a rob on and I was just pausing to make sure I had that correct. Um, we've got a comment from Alicia Dowling. Conflicting messages in one frame has got me thinking. I hadn't thought about it from a values activation perspective. So, yeah, I think many of us are feeling that way. And, in fact, I sat here and I went, oh, I wonder how my our mission statement for our organisation or our um, overall statement fits into though fits into that is it too conflicting or is it actually all aligned in one um, section of those values so I'm going to go back and have a look at it and just assess it from that point of view yeah and even you know print off the, the two maps that I've sent you and just do what I did just circle what does this activate and it's just you know give yourself a little bit of a check and I think what, what happens with the purest of intentions is that we do, we try and go, oh, you know, cover off this space and cover off that base and appeal to that audience and appeal to that audience. And, you know, if you please everybody, you kind of please none. And what mm -hmm. you end up if you just go, well, you know, we'll take a dash of benevolence and, a you know, a slice of universalism, but we'll put in a bit of a power prime there too just to try and appeal to who you imagine would appeal to that you know, who would like that message and you just get a messy jumble. It's like if you've got some really nice coloured pots of paint and they, they work really well on their own or perhaps some of them together, if you mix it all together, you just get a big yucky mess. You know, you don't get what you're intending to, um, intending to do. So in messaging, you know, it's good to stick to, the, remember the ripple effect, environmental, social comms, we really want to be up in that intrinsic value space and those those message segments work really well together. So remember on the map, the closer the values are together, the more compatible they are, whereas if they're opposing, they're in conflict. So, yeah, it's a really common trap as people just try and get a big bucket of values to try and, you know, please all their audience and you can't do that and that's where audience segmentation is really important. And it's important too, you know, if we use that campaign logic again, is tailor your messages to your really keen, have, have your really keen land care people in mind because they'll actually be the spreaders of your message. You're never going to get your message out to, to someone that has absolutely no interest in land care at all, but they might that message might percolate or trickle up to them through a neighbour or a family member. You know, so if and I think if you try to target your message to people who aren't interested, you start priming the wrong values because you start trying to second guess and think, well, maybe it's all about production for them, maybe it's all about money. But if you actually, if it's about land care bringing people together, you know, um, whatever it is, the message that you're trying to actually, what is the thing that's driving land care or your land care group? And it might vary for different events that you're running as well. 
So, you know, you really have to tailor your, your values and your audiences to each other. And they're fit for focus. Thanks, Trudy. I've just got a comment here from Melissa again. Sometimes we tend to over complicate our messages. Simplifying messages around values makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. And I've, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And I've got one more question from Andrea. Who does really well in the NRM space? And I'm assuming you mean from a comms perspective, Andrea. So yeah. I guess you answer it from that perspective. Yeah, well, you see really good examples across all organisations. Mm. Um, some of the land care examples that I just brought up, you know, that um, uh, what was the actual words? It was um, caring, um, I won't try and bring it up now, but working together to care for our country. Mm. Yeah, that's just got beautiful sort of values, power behind it. Um, the ACF as well, they, they're real proponents of this values-based messaging. Have a look at their messaging. It's it's really fantastic and it's it's empowering, it's uplifting. They're very much in that gain growth possibility space. They do don't they do an excellent job. Thank you. Um, look, we've reached half past ten, and I think it's been another great um, level of conversation throughout this um, this morning. If there's somebody who wants to stay on for another five minutes and ask Trudy a question offline, then please feel free to do that. Otherwise, we um, look forward to having Trudy back next week for another session, um, yep. which takes us further down this communication pathway or messaging pathway. So thanks again, Trudy, and I'm sure that everybody gained a lot from it. So I'll stop recording now. Great. Thank you.